Hey folks, this is lecture number 21 uh, for CSE 1322. And uh, before we get started, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, hopefully you guys have all seen at this point that test two grades are now available in Gradescope. Um, so if you haven't already checked that out, go ahead and check that out. Um, they will eventually be transferred over to D2L um, so that they can be averaged into your normal grades, both test one and test two. We figured we'd just do them all together. Um, but you can certainly see your grade right now. Um, if you are not already aware, quiz number seven and quiz eight are both due this Sunday, which is November the 15th. So make sure that you're making progress on those two quizzes. They are both coming up soon here. And today we're going to start the last of our modules, which I believe is module number, uh, module number nine. Um, and what we're doing here today is we're going to talk about data structures. So up until now, there's really only one data structure that you've run into. We have primitive types, which we have talked about, integers, longs, floats, doubles, booleans, those are all primitive types. And then we've talked about um, objects that you have created of your own. Um, and so we've created dogs and cats and buses and trains and all kinds of crazy things. Um, but as far as data structures are concerned, probably the only data structures you've really interacted with so far have been arrays and also array lists. Um, and array lists are form are a part of the collections group, of which there is a number of different options in there. So today we're going to start off and we're going to talk a little bit about linked lists, which is another kind of data structure that you're going to see in most languages. Um, I just want you to understand basically what a linked list is and why you might want to make it. Um, we're going to briefly touch on some of the code, and that's going to be today's lecture. Um, in this module, you're going to find that there are going to be three lectures. I'm going to probably post all of them relatively soon, um, but they cover two weeks. So there's two weeks worth of material. You're just going to get it all up front. Okay, so why do we talk about data structures? Well, a lot of times when you're building programs for whatever reason, you're going to have to structure a whole bunch of data that you're going to need to store at once. So let's take an example. Let's imagine that you were asked to write Owl Express or the registration system that we use here at KSU. So you would have to have some ability to store information about students. And you would need a lot of information about an individual student. So like if you think about what happened when you registered, you probably had to give you know, your SAT scores and a copy of your transcripts and you had to give them your name and your address and your age and your date of birth and a whole bunch of stuff like that. And then the moment that you became a student, it had to record what your degree program was and what year you entered it. And then every class that you've taken since you've been here, what grade you got in that class and so on and so forth. So there's a tremendous amount of data that would have to be stored for any one student. And then just think about the fact that there's 40, 41,000 students here at KSU. So for every one of those students, you have to store that information. And it's actually worse than that because you actually have to store it for every student that's ever been here because they can always come back and request transcripts later again. So storing data inside of an application is a very common problem. You're going to have to do this a lot as you um, go through your future career. So there is an entire class that's dedicated to data structures. It's CS3305. There may be other equivalents in some of the other programs. And most computer science people are going to have to study that because the, the way that you store data inside of your program can have dramatic effects on the speed and efficiency of your program. Um, to put this in perspective, in the worst case scenario, if you store data, it may be that your program is unusable. Even though all the data is in there, looking up one student may take 12 minutes. And if you think about it, when you go to log into the registration system, I'm sure you all have horror stories about some point when it you know, messed you up at the time that you were trying to register. But it pretty much works instantaneously, or at least close enough to instantaneously, that you don't really notice it. If it was truly the case that it took a few minutes every time that you clicked on a page or tried to do anything, you would have complaints left and right. And on top of that, people would lose confidence in the system. So in order for people to use your program, in order for your program to be efficient, it has to be able to store data and retrieve it relatively quickly, regardless of who it is that's asking for it. And again, thinking here, you could imagine that we have somewhere around 40,000 students. But you could also imagine that that data set gets a lot larger. 
So if you were Georgia Power, for example, you probably have somewhere around 10 million users. Okay, yes, they all don't have a house separately, but even still, it's many millions of people. If you think about how many people buy groceries at a grocery store, that's millions, and how many products they might have would be millions as well. So it's not uncommon for there to be this huge data structure that just has thousands and thousands or millions and millions of entries in it, and you might need to be able to pull something out of it very, very quickly. So arrays are great. We've seen arrays and we've seen array lists. They allow you to put data into a specific cell and get the data back out of the cell. Arrays by themselves are structured such that they are a set size, and you have to declare the size when you initially set up the array in the beginning. So array lists, on the other hand, allow us to have dynamically growable and shrinkable lists of things. You don't really have to specify how many items are going to be in the array list before you start. You just start adding things into it. And in your head, it's the size that it needs to be, right? If you say it's 12, it is 12. If you put 13 in there, it's suddenly 13. So that's an example of a dynamic data structure, which is quite different than an array, which would be considered a static data structure. So arrays and array lists actually end up being quite different from one another. All right, so that brings us on to the topic of today's lecture, which is we're going to talk today about a structure called a linked list. A linked list is something that you can define yourself in the programming language of your choice, either in C Sharp or in Java, and it allows you to dynamically shrink and grow your data structure, much like an array list. So, it is considered to be a chain of nodes that are linked together to get you from one to the next. And the nice thing about a linked list is that it will dynamically grow and dynamically shrink. If you add an extra person or remove somebody, then the list shrinks or grows appropriately. The only thing that will ever be a limiting factor for a linked list is if you literally run the system out of memory, then obviously it can no longer store anything else. So linked lists are appropriate when you have data that is unpredictable. So let's take a look at how this might look. So typically you will have what you would consider in your head to be an arrow that's the start of your list. And then you're going to have a node and the node might have a number in it. Let's say we're making a list of numbers. So this might be your KSU ID. So we'll say I'm one, one, two, two, three, three, four. I don't know. And then each of the nodes will also have another arrow that points to the next node, which might be 1122335, which then has an arrow that points to the next node. And then eventually you get to the end, and you will always denote the end with two lines, like I did there. 1122336, I guess, would be that person. So this might be an example of students. And the uh, data that's in there might be your KSU ID. So this is an example of a linked list. Why is it called a linked list? Well, the most important thing to notice here is that each of the nodes is linked to the next node with this arrow that I have. And there's an arrow that gets you to the beginning of the list, an arrow that gets you to the next node, and the next node, and the next node, and the next node. If I wanted to add in another person into this list, then I would simply, and I'm just out of room, so I'm going to draw it in a kind of weird place. I'm just going to put it here. I would simply have it so that that has an arrow that points to here, and I would change where this arrow is pointing to now point to here. And now, even though this is a crazily drawn one, you can see that if you follow the path, it starts here, and then it continues around to here, and then across all the way until it reaches the end, which as I say is drawn with two lines to indicate that's the end of my list. And then you would have inserted, obviously, the student ID in here, one, one, two, two, three, 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 I guess, or whatever number it is that you're adding. It's also possible to add new nodes to the end of the list. They don't always have to go at the beginning of the list, so I could also stick a new node over here. I'll draw it in yellow for no apparent reason. And then I would simply update that arrow to point to here, and now the arrow at the end would be my end of list. So that's what a linked list looks like. We generally draw it in a straight line. In reality, when it's being stored in memory, it's not in a straight line, but visually it makes more sense to us to think about it as a straight or a linear structure where it goes from one node to the next. 
Obviously, that's not quite what I drew here. What I ended up drawing was something that was um, all kinds of weirdness. But if I just abstract it a little bit and shrink it a little bit, you would see that it would look something more like this. I think I ended up with, let's see, how many did I have? One, two, three, four, five. I had five nodes in there. So one more. So that's what that would have actually looked like had it all been in a straight line. So anytime somebody asks you to draw a linked list, you're going to draw something that looks like what you're seeing on the on the board there. Anytime that somebody shows you a linked list, it will usually start off looking like the thing on the board, but every time they go to modify it, they're going to put it a little bit crazily like I did, unless they just have a lot of room to write. So that's what a linked list looks like. Um, so how would you go about making that in code? So when we speak about a linked list, we're certainly going to have a class that is a node. And if we go back to my previous drawing, in each of these cases, and I'll just go to the slightly cleaner one and I'll highlight it in yellow, that is a node. Obviously, so are all of the other ones in the list. I picked one randomly. But a node is made up of an area to store data, whatever the data might have been, which in my previous example was the um, KSU ID, and then a next arrow that gets you to the next node or the link to the next node. So this entire entity is what we would call a node. And if we look at that in code, it's just going to be a class because as you know, classes can have multiple fields in them, multiple attributes. So in this case, we have a public string data. So this one seems to be holding strings instead of holding numbers, which you could of course do. It can be of any of the primitive types or, I mean, honestly, it could even be of an object. You could have a node which has a whole object in it. But for simplicity's sake, let's stick with something simple like a string or a integer. And then you're going to have the next pointer or the next arrow or the next link, which gets you to the next node over. All right, so this is a little bit weird. And if you sit here and stare at this for a moment, you'll notice that there's something odd because it's a little bit self-referencing. I'm in the middle of defining class node, and inside of it, I am using node as next. And that's because the connection to the next node is obviously going to be of type node, because that's what they all are. They're all nodes. They just happen to be linked to each other, and the way that I link to the next one is by using um, a node, which I call next. So each one basically knows the name of the next one in the list, and that's what those arrows were. It's effectively the link or the connection between the nodes. So this is the general description of a node. This data field could be of any type, just depends on what it is that you're trying to store in your link list. And the node field is typically called next. There's nothing magical about the word next. Let me be clear about that. You could have just as easily called this Bob and it would have worked fine, but it would have been a little bit less intuitive when you say, go to the first node, now go to the bob, as opposed to go to the first node, now go to the next. You can see why people tend to call it next. It just logically makes more sense. But again, there's nothing magical about the word next. It is just a variable name. It is the important thing is that it is a variable of this type so that you have a way to link to the next node. All right, so a linked list is effectively a chain of linked nodes. Uh, the data in the uh, each of the nodes has two attributes, which is its data and that next pointer or the next uh, link to the node that you want to go to next. All right, we always use this double slash that I drew, and you can see it here on this picture to represent the end of the list. Well, what is this in particular? Um, it's going to be a magical term called null, which is a reserved word in both C Sharp and in Java, and it represents a point, a place that is nowhere is probably the best way to describe it. It is effectively the end of the list. It's a marker that says we have reached the end. Now, why is that necessary? Because couldn't I just have a linked list that goes on and on and on forever? Well, you're going to see that there needs to be a way when you want to go through the list to pull data back out or to delete something. There has to be a way that you can tell that you've reached the end of the list. And so it, this is just a placeholder is what you should really think about. You might remember a long time ago when we were talking about arrays. I think it was about 200 years ago, as best as I can remember. Um, we were talking about, like, what would it take to find a particular node in an array? Like, find the lowest number in the array. 
Well, if you want to be able to find the lowest number, you're going to want to initialize all of the array to be something really, really high before you start. And so we used like int.max or int max number or something along those lines to store the highest possible value that you can have in an integer. That's just a placeholder. It doesn't, I mean, it is a valid number, but it's not probably something that you actually care about. It's just some way that you can recognize when you've reached the end of the list. Okay, so to review, this is a node. A node contains two things, a data field, which can be of any type, and a next link, which gets you to the next node in the list. You'll have to have a link at the beginning that gets you to the first node, and you'll have to have a null at the end that specifies you've reached the end of the list. Okay, so once you have this structure, there's a couple of things you might want to be able to do. You might want to be able to stick a new node in at the beginning of the list. You might want to be able to stick a new node in at the end of the list. You might want to be able to stick in a new node somewhere in the middle, if you wanted it sorted, for example. You might want to be able to take something out of the list. You're certainly going to want to be able to search the list to find data that's in there. You might eventually want to be able to sort the list. And each of these things is going to take a different amount of time. To be clear, these are all things you could do with an array. There's nothing magical about a linked list that you can do with it that you couldn't do with something else. The main difference is that an array dynamically grows and shrinks as you add and remove data from it, whereas an array is a fixed size data structure. So that's why we want you to be aware of the differences. Okay, so let's go through each of those methods, or at least some of those methods, and let's talk about how to do this. So first off, I'm going to show you that all the code that's in here, I've gone ahead and given you the C-sharp version of it, because most of the code that's in here um, works in either C-sharp or Java. I literally copied and pasted this off the slides. I didn't, um, I think I had to change one thing. I think there was a missing parenthesis and semicolon at the end here. Um, but yeah, other than that, this is pretty much directly copied and pasted off the slides. But if you just want to get to a replet that runs a link list, um, if you grab that URL, you can pause the video, um, that will give you the actual code that we're going to look at here in the um, slides. So I'm going to flip back and forth between the slides and the actual code. All right, so logically, I'm going to show you what it looks like to insert a new node at the beginning of the list. I'm going to start off with something which we're going to call front, and that's going to be my, um, my link to that first node. We're going to assume that right now we have two nodes in the list that are already in here, and I'm just going to store the numbers one and two in them just so that I don't have to write some big long number. So my goal is I would like to insert a new node at the front of the list, and I would like to put the number three into it. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to make a new node, we're going to put the three in it, we're going to set the next to be to the same place as front. So we're going to set next to be equal to this node that is at the current front of the list. And then I'm going to update front to now connect me to the beginning of the new list. So when I updated front, obviously this arrow went away. And that gives me a list, which if I follow it in some red ink, you can see I start off at the beginning, I get to this node, and then if I need to, I can follow it to that node, and I can follow that to this node, and then I follow that to the end of the list. All right. So that's how we would logically insert a new node at the front of the list. So code-wise, let's take a look at that. Um, we instantiate a new node. We fill the data that we want in there. We attach that node at the beginning of the list. That is, we make the node's pointer, the next pointer, point to the original head of the list. And if the list was originally empty, the next would be given the value null, which I'll explain that in a second indicate that the new node is now the head of the list, that is make head point to the new node. So let's see our example. So we start off here and we have an original list. And the original list has four items in it. We're calling the front of the list this time head, which is something that you'll frequently see. Head or front are pretty much interchangeable terms. Again, nothing magical about this. You could call it Bob and Mary and it would work just the same. But again, just from um, simplicity, you probably want head as a name because it's easy to remember. Head at the beginning of the list or front, something along those lines. So this gets you to the first node, the first node gets you to the second node, which gets you to the third node and all the way down until you get to null. That's the original list, it has four items. So now we're going to insert this new node. So we create a new node, 
We called it new node in this case. We put our six in there because that's what we were trying to do. We updated next to point to the same place that head currently points to, and then we changed head to point to the same place that new node points to. So that's logically what it looks like. Um, let's take a look at the code for that. So um, I'm just going to walk you through this real quick. So at the beginning, I have the node class. And in this case, I just have two attributes. I have my int, which stores um, uh, my number. And then I have next, which is of type node. So again, I have num, which is where I'm going to store the number in my linked list. And then I have next, which is that link to the next node. That's all that's in my class for node. This is a very, very simple class. All right, now I have a linked list class. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my first node and I'm going to call it first. And then when I get instantiated, I'm going to set first to null. So my constructor does nothing but set first to null. And that's just so that we know that there's nothing currently in the list. All right, so the thing that we just looked at was add node. And that's going to be this guy right here. So you can see add node takes in one parameter and that parameter is going to be an integer. It creates a new node, so node, new node gets new node, and you node again, node is that class from up above where I just defined at having an int and an x. I called this new node, new node, <laughs> very creative, and then I set the number in it to be the number that was given to me in my argument list. So new node.num is equal to the n that I was given, and new node.next is going to be equal to first. So first was that pointer or that art link that points to the beginning of the list. So what I'm doing is I'm setting the next of my current node to point to that first. And then I simply change first to now point to my new node and life is good. I have successfully inserted into the front of the list. All right, so next up, we're gonna talk about how do you delete out of the list. So we're gonna come back here to a nice clean list like this. <laughs> Okay, maybe we'll just make a new list because that one's not so clean anymore. So we have head, and head is going to point to a node, which is going to point to a node, which is going to point to a node, which is going to point to null. And we're going to put three, seven, and nine in the list. <coughs> so we're imagining that I'm being asked to delete seven. All right, so how would we go about doing that? That's a semicolon or semicolon ever. There you go. Um, all right, so the first thing that you have to do is you would have to start off with some new link, um, which you would begin at the beginning of the list, and you would look to see, is this the number that you're trying to delete, which it is not. So you would then move on to here and check if this is the number that you're trying to delete. It is. Once you know where the node is that you're trying to delete, you're simply going to update the pointer that points to it, which is this guy right here, to now point past him. So effectively, all I'm going to do is that. And that's going to have the effect of deleting this node. And you can see why. Because once I get rid of this link, there's nothing point linking us to this node. It's now gone. I'm able to start at the head of the list. I'm going to do this in yellow just so that you can see something different. Now if I start at the head of the list, I come here. And when I follow next, I get sent to here. And there's no way for me to ever get to that node, thus it is gone. So that's how you do a delete logically. You'll notice there were a couple of weird cases there that you can probably immediately think through. So for example, it's entirely possible, because this is how the world begins, that my link list might have looked like that. So if somebody calls delete 7, um, this will be a grand time for you to use those wonderful exceptions that you had in the last class, because that's an exception. They're asking for you to delete something, and it's not in the list. So you need to tell them that it's not in the list. All right, so that was one possibility. Another possibility is that our head points to a node, which points to null, and that node has a 5 in it. And they ask to delete 7. Well, that's obviously not going to work. If they do ask, to delete 5 in this case, then things are going to get interesting there. I think you can see that pretty quickly. So you're going to start off with head, and you're going to see that head points to the node that you are indeed being asked to um, delete. 
And what I previously told you is that you take the arrow or the link that is pointed to the node that you're trying to delete and you simply update it to point to the whatever was in the next of that node. That's still actually true because if you look at this, after we're done with that update, what you're actually left with is head, which is pointed again over at our null. And that's exactly what you were supposed to have because that's what it looked like when we started. So after you delete the one item that's in there, you're just going to end up with that. So those are the three cases. Case number one, you're asked to delete and there either the number is not in the list or the list is empty. Case number two, you're asked to delete and there's only one item in the list, in which case you're going to end up with an empty list. And then case number three was what we looked at previously, and that is you are asked to delete something from in the middle of the list or the end of the list. It'll work either way. Because, I mean, effectively, if you think about it, this is the same whether or not you're at the end of the list or whether this is just a list with one item. It works exactly the same way. You're just updating the one before it to point to null. All right, so those are the three possibilities for deleting from the list. So if we take a look at this, um, look at the people who made the slides, they know how to make nice straight lines. Um, this is what it looks like after you move the pointer or the, um, the link from uh, five over to two. So that's what things look like. In order to do this, you have to keep track of not only the current, but the previous as well. So in this case, we were being asked to delete the number eight. So what we do is we have to chug our way through the list until we find the eight. At the time that we find the eight, current is going to need to point to the eight, but we're also going to need previous. Now, why? Because from current, there is no way for me to get rid of the eight. Do you see why? Because current has no control of this link. Goodness, why does it keep doing that? All right, this link is not part of current. That link is part of previous, and that's the link that I need to update. In the end, I'm going to point that over to here. So super important that you also keep track of previous as well as keeping track of the current node as you're going through things looking for the thing that you're trying to delete. All right. So let's take a look at the code for delete. Here we go. Um, so we have remove is what we called it apparently and we're going to create two more of those links um, we have first and then we have current all right and we check to see if current num is the one that we're trying to delete then first is going to get current next and then we're going to return all right so let's think about this if the thing that we were asked to delete is um, if the thing that we're asked to delete is in the first node that we looked at, then we're simply going to update first to point to the current nodes next. And back in my happy little picture over here, that was this circumstance down at the bottom. If I can get this to give me that, there we go. That was this circumstance. So you were asked to delete five, it was in the first node, and so you updated the first, the head or the front to talk to or to point to null. All right, while that's not true, while the current node is, the current node's number is not equal to n, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to use a loop to move all the way down the list. So current is going to equal current.next, which has the effect of moving current further down the list one step at a time. If current ever gets to null, then you're going to return because at that point you didn't find it. Um, and we're keeping previous equal to current so that we always have a way to go and actually use the previous pointer once we find it. So presuming that we did find it, the return will not have fired, we'll get out here, and then the update is simply previous next is equal to current next. <coughs> that probably made your head melt a little bit. Let's go back to the slides and let's take a look at why that's the case. So what it said was, previous next equals current next. So previous next, that's this pointer or this link, is now going to be equal to currents next. So that's going to change this pointer or this link 
to point to the same place as that link. So that's going to have the effect of bypassing just like it did down here. So previous next is this link is going to equal the same place as currents next, which is this link. And that has the effect of making this node talk connect to that node. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. So that's the code for add node. That's the code for add node at the back. Um, let's talk through add node at the back. Um, so let's draw a picture again. Aye. There we go. Okay, so we're going to start off with our head, and it's going to give us one node, which is currently null. All right, and there's a seven in here, and you're being asked to add node to back with the number nine in it. Okay. So what you're going to do here is you're going to start off with some kind of temporary link that's going to point to the same place as head. And then you're going to keep going until that links next is null. Once that links next is null, you know you're at the right place. So in this case, it's going to happen on the very first turn because head we'll call this, what did we actually call it in the code, just so that I don't tell you something crazy, it's called temp. So T-E-M-P. All right, so temp is going to uh, be pointed in the same place as head initially. What we're going to look for is if temp up dot, or sorry, if temp dot next is equal to null, which it is, then temp dot next is going to get a new node. We're going to put the nine in it. Temp next next is going to be null and life is good. If we had started off with this, such that, I'm um, just going to clean that up a little bit. Back to the pen. If we had started off with 7 and 9 already in here, and we were being asked to insert 19, then we would start off with temp pointed at the same place as head. We would say, is temp's next null? And you can see that temp's next, which refers to this guy, is not null. So, OK, temp's next is not null. So what we're going to do is we're going to set temp equal to temp's next. So what is temp's next? Temp next is that guy. So we're going to set temp equal to temp's next, which means he's no longer there. He's now over here. All right, now we check to see is temp's next null? And it is because follow temp, look at the next, and you can see that it's null. So now we know where to add our new node. So we say temps next gets a new node, temps next next gets null, temps next data gets 19, because that's what we were being asked to insert here. All right, and this will work no matter how many entries are in the list. So this is add to back of list. All right, so the code here is we create this temp node. Uh, we set the number in the temp node to be n. We set current to point to wherever the front of the list is. And while currents next is not null, we keep making current equal to currents next. And then eventually, currents next equals temp. So I'm going to walk through those steps because they're ever so slightly different than the way that I did it in my example. So I'm just going to use consistent names because I agree this is probably getting confusing here. So at the beginning, they were calling it first. So first we will imagine currently points to a list that has three elements in it. And they are one, two, three, and that one, of course, points to null. Okay, so the first step was temp gets a new node. So we have temp gets a new node. Cool. Temp's number gets n. So we're presuming it's 19 that I'm adding. You will remember that when a new node is created, um, never mind, ignore that I was going to say that. All right, node current equals first. So this makes another new thing called current, C-U-R-R-E-N-T, and it's currently linked to the same place as first. That's this line of code here. All right, so current points to there. Now we go into our loop. 
while current next is not null, set current to currents next. So is currents next current next is this guy, is that equal to null? Well, the answer is no, it's not. So it's going to say current gets current dot next. So current dot next is this guy. So current is going to be set equal to currents next. I drew that really sloppily, mostly because things were getting crazy. So instead of it pointing here, it's now going to point to currents next, which is there. All right, we go back to the start of the loop. Is currents next not equal to null? Current, which is this guy, is next, which is this guy now, is that equal to null? It's not. So we're going to say current equals currents next. Well, that means that current is no longer pointed here. Currents next is the arrow that I just drew, and current now points to it. So that's going to have current now pointed here. All right, and now we're finally going to check the loop again. Is currents next equal to null? It is. So finally, that loop is going to stop executing. And at this point, current is pointed where it is. So now the last step of all of this is currents next is set equal to temp. So that's going to have the effect of changing currents next is now equal to temp. All right. We know that when the node was created, its next pointer was set to null because that's part of the constructor. So first now points to 1, which points to 2, which points to 3, which points to 19, and we have successfully inserted at the back of the list. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, trying to remove something out of the list, how are we going to do that? Um, so again, we're going to create these current and previous things, and what we're going to do is we're going to trace this one out as well. So we're going to start off with an imaginary list, and we will be consistent with our names, which is first, And we're going to put in three items into our list, just randomly, just so we have something to look at. We're going to put one, two, and three in there. Cool. So the very first thing that happens is we create a current, which points to the same place as first, which means it looks like that. And then we're going to have previous, which is also going to point was it prev? Uh, it was just C-U-R-R. Cur. Apparently it is speak like a pirate day. Cur points to um, the same place as first, and then previous points to the same place as cur. So at this moment in time, after having completed those two lines, that's the state of affairs. We have three separate things all pointed to the same spot. Cool. All right. For this example, we are trying to delete the number 2. So I'm going to write that up at the top. We are doing delete, which is probably called remove because the world hates me. Of course it's called remove. All right, we are doing remove 2. That's how we were called. So our n in this case is the number 2. Goodness gracious. All right. So if cur.num equals n, so cur is this guy, dot num is this, does 1 equal 2? It does not. So we're going to skip and we're going to get down to the while condition. While cur.num is not equal to n, which we just checked that and it is not, we're going to set previous equal to cur, which is already true because previous is currently in the same place as cur. And then we're going to set cur equals cur dot next. So I'm going to switch colors to red. Cur is this guy. Dot next is this guy. And we're going to set cur equal to that spot, which is going to have the effect of cur now pointing to here. All right. And then we're going to say if cur equals null, return. Well, cur does not equal null. It's clearly pointing at a node. 
So we're going to go around this while loop again. cur.num not equal to two uh, to n. n is two. So is cur, which is this guy, dot num, which is this guy, equal to two? It is. Life is good. So we have found the magical place. So this while loop, while loop is going to exit, and we're going to come down here and do this last step. And it sounds very confusing, but it's really not. Previous dot next is going to now equal current dot next. All right, pick another color, blue. Previous dot next, which is this guy, is now going to equal current, which is this guy, dot next, which is this guy. So previous next is going to equal current next, which is going to have the effect of doing that. And now this connection is gone because I just updated it. All right, and you can see that that did indeed have the effect of making it so that the start of the list is a one and the next item in a list is a three and the next item in the list is null. We've successfully deleted the node that we wanted to delete. So that seems to have worked pretty well. Display, this code is ever so slightly different depending on Java or C Sharp just because of the capitalization of string. But basically, it's just going to go through the list and print out all of the entries that are in there. So again, we're making a current which points to the front. And then we're going to start off a string which we're calling data, which we're going to set it equal to nothing, an empty string. And while current's next is not null, we're going to add to the current string the current number followed by an arrow, and then we're going to move current to the next, which is going to add space, the number that's in the node, an arrow, space, the number that's in the next node, an arrow, space, the number that's in the next node, an arrow. And the reason it's because of the next node is because of this line, which is moving us along. And then at the very end, we're giving you the last line of data. Okay, so let's go over to our fun little replet here, because this is my idea of fun. And we are going to clear the screen just so that you're starting off from scratch. And what's happening down in our main method is that we are instantiating a new instance of our linked list object. We are going to console write line that, which is just going to print out its name in C sharp. So I'm actually going to just turn that off because it's not very useful in C sharp. In Java, you'll get um, a big long string of memory addresses and all kinds of crazy things. Uh, if you wanted that to be more useful, you needed to override to string, which is not done in this code. Um, all right, so I'm going to call ll, which is my linked list, dot add node five. So that's going to put a node at the beginning. So let's trace out what's happening. We have our, um, we start off with our uh, linked list and it has our front and when the linked list is created, we know that front gets set to null. So now we're going to look and we're going to do the first line of code, which is ll.addNode5. And so you will remember what's going to happen is it's going to add a node here and it's going to put the number five in there. Next off, we're going to add node seven and that's going to create a new node here with a seven. It's going to point that to here and it's going to update front to point to there. And then we're going to call add node one, which is going to create another new node, put a one in it, set next on it to point to the front, and then update front to point down to the new node. So that's what our, li our list looks like at this point. Now we're going to add to the back the number four. So that's going to create the temporary pointer or the temporary guy, which is gonna look down here, and then it's going to follow to here and then it's going to follow to here. And now at this point, it sees that the next is equal to null. So on next, it's going to add a new node. It's going to shove the number four into it. The new node's next is going to be null. And we should end up with a list that has one, seven, five, four, because we added them at the front and then we added at the back finally. So if I run this, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, return at that point, just so that we don't um, go past that, we should see a list and it has one, seven, five, four. And you can see one, seven, five, four. And it doesn't ever draw the null at the end, but I think you get the general idea. Okay, so next up, we're going to allow it to remove the number five. So what's going to happen with that, I'll do this one in red, 
it's going to start off at the beginning and it's going to say, is that equal to five? It's not. So it's going to move that guy over to here and it's going to say, is that equal to five? No, it's not. So it's going to move this guy up to here and then it's going to say, is that equal to five? Yes, it is. So then it's going to take the previous next, which is this guy. I know it's all getting squiggly here, but the previous next is going to be changed to point to the current's next, which is going to have the effect of that guy going away. And if you follow the red lines, <laughs> then you are coming into the beginning of the list, going to the seven, and then going over to the four, and then coming out at the null at the end. So that's going to do the delete. And what we would expect to see is 174 after that has been done. So I'm just going to do a return just so that it stops at this point, And we should see 174. Indeed we do. Life is good. All right, we're going to remove 9, which is not in the list, just to see what happens there. And you're going to see that I didn't spell return. <laughs> Retort. Retort, I tell you. All right, so you're going to see that nothing changed because, well, there was no nine, so it just returned. All right, and then finally, we're going to add in an eight, which is going to get put in at the front, and we're going to add in a three. So I'm just going to draw it as it currently is. Uh, we have front, and that currently points to one, seven, and four. All right, and we were asked to add node eight. So when we do add node eight, it's going to, ooh, that's an eight. It's going to create a new node. It's gonna put an eight in it. It's going to set the next equal to the front of the list. And then it is going to update the front of the list to point to that new eight that we just created, which gets rid of that guy. All right, and that, does that and then the last step is add node 3 which is going to work very similarly 3 is going to get added that's going to connect to there and then front is going to be changed to point to that new node that we just created like so so we should see 38174 if i remove all my return statements which i already have 38174 all right so that is how linked lists work Hopefully that makes some sense to you guys. Uh, that's just the code for the main. Um, so what I want you to get out of all of this, what is a linked list? A linked list is a data structure that is dynamic, which grows and shrinks as you add and remove entries out of there. In order for a linked list to work, you need a node class. That node class will contain whatever data you're trying to store in the linked list, which in this case we called num, and it will contain a next link to another node. And this works in all languages. You're often going to hear that next being referred to as a pointer. We try to avoid the word pointer in Java and C Sharp because they don't really deal in pointers. But if you take a C++ class or a C class, then you'll absolutely call those pointers. But effectively, they're just links or arrows or pointers. They're all pseudonyms for the same thing. So it's a way to connect to the next node in the list. Then we had our linked list class. We implemented it such that Anytime a node is created, it automatically is set to null. And then we added code to add a node at the front, add a node at the back, remove a node, and display the current state of the list. You might also need to write a search so that you can see if something is in the list. And if you wanted to go off and write that on your own, which I would recommend, you could start with the remove code. And all you would have to do is return true or false as to whether you found it rather than actually deleting the node, which is what happens with the delete function or the remove function. You might also need to sort the list, and that's a lot more difficult than you might think it is. So I'm not going to cover that in this uh, lecture. We're going to talk about a couple of different ways that you might want to use a linked list in our next lecture when we talk about stacks and queues. So that's it for lecture number 21. Hope you guys are having a wonderful week, and I will talk to you soon.